All righty. Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, it is really an honor to see this many people here to talk about such an important topic for our state. Um, so we're going we're gonna to have uh, quite a number of speakers actually today. We're going to try to keep this press conference pretty brief because we do want to have uh, an opportunity for questions uh, to, to be answered by uh, the folks that are up here. I want to start off by uh, thanking the people that helped to organize this press conference and the people that were able to come out today. Um, the first speaker that we're going to have on this very important issue of protecting uh, patients across the state of Michigan is my dear friend and colleague, Senator David Knizek. Uh, and I want to emphasize that these, this, this bill, these bills that we're doing right now are not only bicameral, which means that we have both senators and representatives both on board, but it is also bipartisan, where we have uh, some across the aisle work that's being done. Um, so this is very important that we stand up and protect patients across the state. And to start things off, we're going to hear from my good friend, Senator David Knizek. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I, I am going to be brief, because uh, it doesn't matter what I say to you here today. Uh, that will pale in comparison to the personal stories that you're going to hear from our patients today uh, and the importance of guaranteeing their safe access to medicine. I also wanted to recognize my colleague, Representative Robbie. Uh, he's been generous enough to bring me on this journey with him. He has been the tip of the spear in the legislature from day one on trying to correct this issue. So I wanted folks to know just how passionate and how committed he's been uh, and how thankful I am to have allowed, uh, for you to have allowed me to join you on that journey. It has been nearly 10 years since voters approved Proposal 1 here in Michigan, uh, making us the 13th state to legalize medical marijuana. And last year, the legislature passed a package of medical marijuana bills to begin issuing state licenses and ultimately to clear up any confusion related to their legality. As the state begins accepting applications for licenses, unfortunate, unfortunately, we're seeing that patients are facing yet another legal loophole. Provisioning centers that have been opened for years will be forced to make a decision between operating in legal limbo, which could risk their application for a state-issued license, or closing their doors to the patients who rely on their sustained access to medicine. The state does not force drivers to stop driving for three months while they wait to renew their license, and we feel that the same should be true when it comes to patients' access to medicine. The legislation that we are introducing here today would ensure that Lara can do their jobs working through licensing while patients still have access to the care that they need and deserve. These patients would allow provisioning centers to stay open while they pursue state licensure through the implementation of the Medical Marijuana Acts that were signed into law last year. We believe that it is time to provide patients with the stability and the reliability that they need to purchase their medication, and that's exactly what our bills do. These bills would allow patients to continue to have safe access and reliable medicine while the state, the state sifts through these license applications. It is time to do what the voters wanted us to do nearly 10 years ago by approving Proposal 1 and the use of medical marijuana. And so I thank you for your attendance and your interest here today. I look forward to working with my colleagues again on both sides of the aisle and on both sides of the Capitol to resolve this issue once and for all. I'm going to bring up Representative Robbie again to make sure that we can introduce uh, our patients here today. Uh, and I know we'll be taking questions at the end. So thank you again for your time. Thank you again, uh, Senator, for all of your great work on this issue. Um, as, we, as you are quickly finding out the focus of this uh, press conference is really on our patients. Uh, and so who we're going to hear from today uh, are patients from across the state that, uh, that have very important voices to lend to this conversation. We're going to start off uh, hearing from uh, Ida Chinonis. Um, and so Ida, I will invite you up to the podium here to, to, share, your, um, to share your story. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ida Chinonis, and this is my daughter, Gabriella who has been a medical marijuana patient for two and a half years. She is currently off of all pharmaceutical medications. We rely on medical marijuana for her health, for her life. She is recovering from hip surgery that she had last February. She went into status, epileptus. I almost lost her. The only thing that brought her back to me was medical marijuana. 
She was in ICU for five days. They would not give it to her in hospital. I had to sneak it in and give it to her, which I did, and I will continue to do to take care of my daughter. I thought that this was taken care of. I thought that we were done coming here and fighting for this. I don't understand why we're still here. We need safe access. I cannot stockpile five different medications for over a year. How am I going to drive back and forth to, to cart that much and keep in my house for, five, for a whole year when she's on five different forms of medication? That's just, I'm flabbergasted that I'm up here asking that the dispensaries stay open. I, I, I don't understand why this is such an issue. I do want to thank Kenner, Senator Kniesik and, and Representative Robbie for their, their hard work and dedication in this issue. It's a very important issue, and not only is Bella affected, but all medical marijuana patients across the state are affected. And I just really and truly hope that we're able to keep some leeway, keep the dispensaries open, and work through this process and through this issue so that it doesn't become an issue and no one has to die from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for sharing your powerful story with us. Um, next, we'll hear from uh, Carla Boyd, who is a parent, but who also is here representing the Epilepsy Foundation. Thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Carla Boyd, and I'm on the board of directors for the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. But I'm also a mother of a 15-year-old child who has incurable drug-resistant epilepsy and is currently taking CBD oil to relieve her seizures. This is Lane. On behalf of the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan and the almost 110,000 people in our state who suffer from seizures, we urge you to support the bill being led by Representative Robbie and Senators Knezic. This bill will ensure that access to medical cannabis is not disrupted during the transition to the new licensing regulations. Current dispensaries should remain open and appropriately regulated while the new regulations are being communicated and the new system for the state's medical cannabis program is being implemented. We appreciate the concerns with the current situation and support the compliance with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. However, it would be extremely harmful to many in the state if no dispensaries were operating for any period of time. Relying exclusively on caregivers to produce cannabis for patients is less safe and reliable than most existing dispensaries. And without these dispensaries, access will be extremely limited. And I cannot overstate that for many suffering from epilepsy and other conditions in Michigan, my daughter and Bella included, this is a matter of life and death. Epilepsy is a medical neurological condition that produces seizures affecting a variety of mental and physical functions. Approximately one in 26 Americans will develop epilepsy in their lifetime. About 3,000 people a year in our country will die from sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. And there is no one size fits all treatment. And like my daughter, 30% of all people or 1 million Americans suffering from this condition will never find full seizure relief. And many more live with significant side effects despite these treatments. And that is why some people living with uncontrolled seizures turn to medical cannabis when everything else has failed. The foundation speaks on behalf of the more than 3.5 million Americans suffering from epilepsy and seizures. We foster the well-being affected by seizures through research, educational activities, advocacy, and direct services. We are committed to supporting physician-directed care and to exploring and advocating for all potential treatments for epilepsy, including medical cannabis. As long as there is no cure for epilepsy, every single viable option for treatment must be on the table. People with uncontrolled seizures live with the constant risk of serious injuries and death. If a patient and their healthcare provider believe the potential benefits of medical cannabis outweigh any risks, they should have that legal option. And nothing should stand in the way of patients getting access to potentially life-saving treatments. The majority of states have enacted laws to authorize state-run medical cannabis programs. And in these states, a number of people with epilepsy using medical cannabis are reporting control of seizures and significant improvements. The foundation supports state-regulated cultivation, production, and dispensing of medical cannabis to ensure safe and legal access to this very promising treatment option. 
Comprehensive licensing requirements are critical to the development of an effective and meaningful medical cannabis program. We look forward to the new licensing regulations next year and are confident that access and reliability will improve in Michigan. However, it is critical to ensure practical transition for existing patients who rely on these therapies right now. And while not everyone with epilepsy should or would consider medical cannabis and further research is most definitely needed, medical cannabis when prescribed by a treating physician may be the best alternative for some individuals living with epilepsy. People with epilepsy who have their medication switched or who experienced any delay in accessing their medication are at high risk for developing breakthrough seizures and related complications, including death. The Epilepsy Foundation of America and Michigan urges a seamless transition to the new licensing system for medical cannabis in Michigan and to proceed with extreme caution to not disrupt patient care. Thank you. Thank you so much for that statement and for being here on behalf of the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan and for your daughter. And to you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before we move to the next speaker, I just want to recognize that we have, uh, as an example of some of our bipartisan support for this bill, uh, we have a representative from uh, Martin Hauerlach's office here uh, who is a Republican. We have a representative from Ronnie Peterson's office here right behind him uh, who is one of my Democratic colleagues and a representative from Adam Zemke's office who is another one of our uh, Democratic colleagues. So uh, great bipartisan support in the House and thank you uh, for being here with us today. Um, I'll move on now to our next speaker. Emily Mabong is a pediatric patient that would like to uh, address us. So thank you for being here. Or has a yeah, I'm a mother of a uh, six-year-old daughter named Mariella, and um, she has a rare epilepsy condition called PCDH19 epilepsy. It uh, presents with severe life-threatening clusters of seizures that always require um, hospitalization and, and often stop her breathing and require resuscitation. Um, she has been on medical cannabis for a year and a half and has been seizure free for 403 days. Prior to that, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, prior to that, we lived in the hospital and the ICU uh, more often than we lived at home. And uh, it's very important that we, um, that we are able to keep her, her medication going. Um, because her seizures are so life-threatening, she is at very high risk of sudden death from epilepsy if she had any break in her medication. Um, and uh, even though the doctors did everything that they could, they tried every type of medication out there, she, um, her seizures went uncontrolled. They gave her less than 2% chance of ever finding control and, um, and expected that her seizures eventually would kill her. So um, now my daughter, who um, is flourishing because of medical cannabis. She also has had a tremendous amount of healing happen in her brain and went from, uh, went from stuttering two to three word sentences to reading and speaking two grades ahead of her class in just six months on cannabis. So for my daughter, please, please support this bill to um, keep the dispensaries open. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Emily. I'm sorry for my misstatement earlier. Thanks for correcting the record. Uh, wonderful. So we have uh, now uh, our last uh, guest speaker. Um, Justin Nichols is an Army veteran. Um, thank you so much for being here, Justin. I'd like to uh, thank Senator Knesik and uh, Representative Robbie. Um, my name is Justin Nichols. Um, I'm an 11-year honorably discharged combat veteran. Uh, I find today to be uh, pretty serendipitous because the meeting that I had earlier today, I was meeting with uh, some owners of dispensaries, uh, growers who were coming together to provide not only free access and resources in the form of CBD oil, um, different types of concentrates, flour, whatever you, whatever you can think of essentially for veterans to try to bypass a lot of the prescriptions that get passed through through the VA. Uh, which I'll speak on uh, here shortly, but not only that, but financial aid from that. Um, if they're not providing that type of clean med for veterans, uh, a lot of those uh, financial resources go to uh, underfinanced resources that are here for veterans. Uh, that combat homelessness, uh, unemployment, the list could go on and on. Um, 
But my, my path to this, and I'll try to make it very quick, um, about two years ago, I found myself in a very dark place. Um, I went to the VA and was given just a slew of prescription drugs. Um, I wasn't myself. It was essentially one of the most uh, violent roller coasters that I've been through. It's kind of weird to be trapped in your own head. Um, I reached out to a very good friend of mine. Um, if you ever need a, other than these inspirational stories up here, an additional one, his name's Derek Carver. Uh, last year he became the world's strongest adaptive athlete. Uh, he lost his left leg in Afghanistan. He's a first lieutenant um, of the 82nd Airborne, uh, who's gone from 30 prescription drugs down to the two, three essential ones for extreme pain uh, through the use of uh, medicinal marijuana or clean meds. Um, I reached out to him because I was kind of at the end of my rope. Started where my life was heading. Uh, I just felt like I was at a standstill. Um, I reached out to him and I said, how are you feeling? How are you doing this? I need a change in my lifestyle. Um, and he just broke it down to me. Um, I currently use CBD oil for injuries I sustain uh, throughout the military. Uh, I use uh, different forms of clean meds uh, to help me go to sleep at night, uh, where I was only getting three to four hours of sleep. I'm now consistently at least getting eight hours. Um, I'm currently a business owner. Um, I'm also a consultant and contractor for a company uh, out of Atlanta. Um, and I also uh, lend here in the state, uh, focusing primarily on VA loans. I guess the, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that when I made that transition, it led me to a healthier lifestyle. Um, I wasn't putting manufactured uh, products into my body that were stopping me from a lot of things um, that I felt were a benefit to my lifestyle. Uh, my life has drastically improved. I've been with plenty of veterans um, that use this as an alternative uh, with the other, I, I don't know, I, I'm trying to find a very uh, articulate way of putting this without letting my army mouth come out. Um, <laughs> but I feel is a disrespect to the veteran community on a lot of forefronts. Uh, I think this would just be a huge slap in the face uh, to the veteran community because this is providing a massive benefit. Um, I would say the biggest one was letting me get outside of myself. Um, being stuck in your head like that. Excuse me. <clears throat> is tough. And uh, this allowed me to take a very positive step forward and affect other I said a friend uh, <clears throat> who doesn't have these type of resources take their life and uh, maybe that would have helped them. So I would say for the people up here, uh, for the community that I speak on, um, I think you should look outside yourself and what your personal stance on it is and look at the people that it affects in a positive way. Um, and you need to pass this through and let these dispensaries stay open and serve the community that is currently serving. Thank you. So Justin, I, I want to thank you not only for speaking to us today, but for your service to our country. Um, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do some closing remarks, but before I do that, I want to introduce everybody to Tommy Brand. Uh, Tommy is one of my great colleagues in the House. Um, oftentimes, there's, it feels like there's not a lot of heart and compassion in Lansing. Tommy is somebody with both heart and compassion. And he was willing to sign on to this bill to keep our uh, dispensaries open. So um, thank you, Tommy, for being here and for your support. So in closing, I just want to say uh, we have a choice to make as Michigan. Uh, this is a choice where on the one hand, uh, we have a situation where we, where we have clear, a clear example of regulatory overreach that is pushing against the will of the voters of the state. And on the other hand, we have patients, people that you've heard from today and thousands of others across this state who depend on safe access. 
And as we have heard, it can be a matter of life and death. So we can't stand on the sidelines and let the government stand in the way of people getting safe access to care. That's why we're standing here today. That's why uh, Senator Knizek and others on the Senate side are working so hard to introduce their bill. That's why I've introduced House Bill 5014 on the, on the House side with, again, bipartisan support to make sure that we can keep our dispensaries across the state open. We can't go back. We can't go back in time. Here in Michigan, we have something very important, safe access. And while the legislation that was passed in 2016 changes the landscape, we can't let this intermediary period disrupt what we've built here in the state. We can't put our patients back out on the street and say, good luck. That's not right. That's not right. We can't force our business owners to potentially go out of business. We have to stand up for the network of patients around the state who rely on safe access.